to be back with you. God blessed me last year with the opportunity to be with you. And uh, it's good to see you. I, I, I like coming from to different places and be able to say that I recognize faces. Now, don't ask me to tell you your name because that's not going to happen. Uh, but it's good to see you all. Very, very good to see you all. When I first came in, they had the fan blowing here in the hallway and it was pretty loud and... Uh, Somebody commented that I was going to have to probably speak up. And, you know, I said, that's the first time in my life anybody has ever said, Corey, you need to speak louder. <laughs> but instead they decided to turn it off and see if we can't turn the heat up in this place. I was asked to speak with you tonight about the Christian home. Um, and, and that's um, it's a really broad topic when you think about it any number of different directions you could go to to, to focus on. And I, I, I've chosen to focus tonight on this idea of raising stronger children. Let me explain to you why that has come to the forefront of my mind. I, not too long ago, I was, as I was spending some time just perusing various news things, news feeds and whatnot, I, I came across an article that had appeared on the nationalreview.com site in August of 2016. And it had an article that the title was, Young American Males Are Losing Touch with a Critical Element of True Masculinity. Now, that's a lengthy title for an article. But I have to admit it piqued my curiosity. And so I clicked on it, and I was reading through it. The article went on to describe studies that a certain group had done testing the hand strength, the grip strength of, of young men and categorizing or, or comparing that to, uh, to their dads and to their granddads, and to their great-granddads. And what they, well, let me just read the summary. Uh, the article goes on to summarize the study in, in saying this, Indeed, the grip strength of the sample of college men had declined so much. It had declined from 117 pounds of force down to 98 pounds of force. It had declined so much that it now matched that of older millennial women. In other words, the average college male had, more, had no more hand strength than a 30-year-old female or a 30-year-old mom. Simply put, we're getting soft. Now, you can put whatever stock you want to put into that kind of a study. You know, studies are about as good as a study is good for and you can typically make it say what you want it to say, but I, I did think that it was an interesting observation. And as I read through it, it occurred to me that this, this concept could very possibly be applied in a broader spectrum. Specifically what came to my mind, it could be applied concerning the demographic of Christian families. If you could find stats to measure, and who knows, I'm sure there's probably somebody somewhere that has found some. If you could find statistics to measure, would we discover that compared to previous generations, our Christian families are getting soft? that the strength of the next generation of Christians is getting increasingly weaker one generation after another. Now, maybe I'm wrong. And, and, and the Lord knows, I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's not the case that successive generations of Christians are getting weaker than the ones before. Either way, though, whether I'm wrong or I'm right on that possibility... It's a concern that we all have in our minds, is it not? As, as parents and grandparents, that we, we know, we feel the need and the compulsion and the importance 
of raising a, the next generation uh, of our kids and grandkids to love the Lord, to fear Him, and to live lives in faithful obedience to the God of heaven and earth. Don't we understand that? Don't we, don't we feel that need? And so it seems fitting to me tonight, given the, the topic that I was asked to talk about with the Christian home, I thought it fitting to, to chew on this here for a little bit. Chew on this idea of, of looking ahead to future generations. Considering how it is that, that we as the current parents and grandparents, and I'll say great-grandparents, as teachers and preachers and role models, what can we be doing? What do we need to be doing in order to help raise stronger kids so that in successive generations to come, we're not just going to have stronger kids who grow into strong adults, but those strong adults are going to start having families of their own, and they're going to start having stronger Christian families, which is going to result in stronger Christian homes. And when you have stronger Christian homes, let me tell you what ultimately you will have. It may take time, you'll have a stronger nation and you'll have a stronger church because we took the time to raise them properly now. Tonight I want to go through three principles. We're going to look at three Old Testament passages. I want to look at three principles that I hope we can glean out of these passages to help us learn and some things that I hope are very practical. I don't want to just talk to you about theory. All right, I want to try to give us some, some practical suggestions and practical things that we can all implement into our homes now that will help bring about stronger families and stronger kids later on. If you would, open up your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I, I want to read verses 4 through 9 of this passage. Uh, real quick, as you are turning to it, just to bring about a little bit of the context, uh, Deuteronomy uh, is, is it's a long book in the, in the form that we have it. Uh, most likely what it seems is that as Moses was coming to the end of his life, he knew that he was about to die. When you've been leading a group of people for 40 years, the question becomes, well, what are you going to say to them at the end? And Moses had found out already that he was going to, to die and not go to the promised land. And as he was coming to the end of his life, I'm sure he, like any other longtime leader, was thinking, well, what am I going to say to these people? How am I going to finish out this time as their leader? And through the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, this is what Moses gave them. It's a series, probably a, a series of, of uh, sermons or, or speeches that Moses gave that, that chronicle uh, the giving of, of the Mosaic Law. It is also chronicling aspects of the history of Israel as a nation to that point. And it is also filled with various warnings and encouragements and admonitions for them as a people before they head into the promised land that they have been waiting on for so long. And so that, that's what's happening here in the book of Deuteronomy as a whole. Read with me, if you would, verses 4 through 9. Moses speaks to the people. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The first principle I want us to consider tonight in raising stronger kids is that we need... Make sure I have this going right. We need to make sure that we are keeping the Word of God at the forefront of their mind. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is... For me, it is... It is one of my top ten passages in all of the Bible. I might even go, I haven't tried to num you know, number them out myself, but it might even rank in my top five. I love this passage of Scripture. 
I think it has so many lessons that, that are appropriate, that obviously were appropriate in that time, but are even appropriate for us today, such as the need to, become awa- to, to beware of becoming too affluent, of having too much stuff. If you go through and you read verses uh, 10 through 15, you'll find out he says, hey, be careful when you go into that land and you have wells that you didn't dig and houses you didn't build and pantries that you didn't fill. Be careful that you don't step out one day and look around with your cup of coffee off your Keurig and say, boy, have I done well for myself. He says, because you're going to forget who gave you all of this, that it was my hand who brought all of this to you. And, and I think there's, there's some great warnings and great lessons for us to learn and understand about needing to beware of becoming overly afflict, overly wealthy because we tend to forget God as human beings. But perhaps the most prominent section of this passage is verses 4 and 5. What in centuries to come after they were first spoken by the Lord through Moses, they're going to become known as the greatest command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Right? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Tells them in these words, he says, this has got to be the priority. Some of, your, some of the versions you may read from at the bottom are going to say things like, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or that, that phrase can also be translated something to the effect of, The Lord is our God alone. Or the Lord alone is our God. And this becomes a statement of faith. Not just, certainly within the Jewish community, and I'm going to make mention of that here in a little while as we bring some application, but but I want you to understand that, that this is not just a passing statement. This is a huge statement of faith. This is making the top priority of everything that they do to be focused upon God. The Lord is the one and only God, and the Lord is our only God. But notice what he says as well in verse 6. These words that I'm commanding you today, don't just put them in your brain. Put them in your heart. And not only are you to put them in your heart, but you are to put them into the heart of your children. You are to teach these words diligently to your children. How are we supposed to do that? Well... To to put something in one's heart, the word that comes to my mind is the idea of internalizing. You have to internalize this message from God. It has to become a part of who you are. It has to become your instinct, the the, the foundation upon upon why you do what you do. It is the lens through which you see everything else. How do you do that? Well, it comes partly from memorization. Literally putting the the words of God in your mind. But it also comes from application. I'm sure we've all probably met people, they could quote massive sections of the Bible. But if you watched them, they didn't know how to live those massive sections of the Bible. We need to be teaching our children, and we need to be committing it to memory, but we also need to be teaching them and living out and figuring out ourselves, how do I live out these words that there is one God and He alone is our God? I want you to consider, as you keep reading through those verses, Moses actually gives us some of the venues by which we can put into practice the memorization and application of God's Word. He says you, you are to, to teach these diligently to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You're supposed to bind it as signs on your, on your hands and, and as frontlets between your eyes. Where am I supposed to point this thing at? Right there? Does that get us? Next slide, please, if you can help me up there on the very top. 
supposed to put them as, as f signs on your hands and frontlets uh, between your eyes. And, and he says, put them as signs on your doorposts and on your gates. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to go through here and for a few minutes, I want us to consider how do we take all of these different things that, that he has said and how do I put those into practical application? How do I use, basically, if you listen to that, every single moment of my life, right? Is there any time when you're not doing one of those things? Sitting at home, going about on the way, lying in bed, rising from bed? Is there any time that you're not sitting down looking at the, the, looking at the things on your walls? No. No, we, we, we keep on doing those things. So basically, everywhere we go, it's when we're supposed to be doing Well, consider with me, how do I practically put some of that into place? Well, he says that we're supposed to be teaching these things to our kids when, uh, when you sit in your house. Let me ask you a question. Do you have regular Bible time with your kids? Do you regularly sit down together and open up the Word of God? Or sit down and discuss... The Word of God, I guess it caught up to me, didn't it? Let me back this thing up quite a bit. Do you spend that time with them? And you have to maybe adjust this to whatever your children are capable of understanding. You know, you may have a little children's Bible that you sit down and you talk about some of these stories. Uh, do, do, you, do you spend time singing songs with them? Do you spend time praying? Hearing them, uh, them hearing you pray. Do you have them pray as a family? I, I don't, I don't want to belabor this particular point because those of you that were here to, hear, to listen to Glenn Colley a couple of weeks back, I know he talked an awful lot about this. This is one of the things that he is very passionate about. But, but I want you to consider the idea that, that when, when we are living our lives, we have to be observing and looking for teachable moments. And having specific Bible time at home is going to be a way that we ingrain the message of God within the lives of our children. Don't just let them be hearing about God when they're sitting in these pews. Don't wait on, on a youth minister or youth deacons to be the ones to teach your kids about the gospel. It's not the youth minister and youth deacons' job to raise your kids spiritually. It's their job to supplement what you're already doing at home. And I can say that because I spent almost a decade as a youth minister. Spend time with your kids in the Bible. Be diligent about teaching them when we're at home. But he also says that you need to be, using the, uh, that you need to be teaching them diligently when you walk on the way. This is when we're out and about. To me, I, I read that, I see that phrase, and I think to myself, we need to be taking advantage of teachable moments when we're out and about living life. Not long after we moved to, uh, to the Woodlands, my wife was out with some good friends of ours, people who became really, really good friends of ours. Her, the, the lady's name is Jennifer Watrous. And, and Paige and Jennifer were out riding around one day, and Jennifer at the time had little kids. Goodness, they, her oldest one's a Marine now, and she's got two others that are coming on up to the high school ranks. Make me feel old. But, but, but they were driving down the road one day, and... and Daniel or Kelsey, one of the little ones, he, he went, oh, mommy, look, it's a bird. And as they were riding down the road, there was just a bird, just happened to fly eye level with them for about 20, 30, 40 feet, long enough to be able to look at it and see it. And, and you know, you, most of us, we look and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's neat. Great, wow, that's really fun. You know what Jennifer did? This made such an impression upon me. She said, oh, that is so much fun. And she stopped right in the middle of the car, and she said, thank you, God, for that moment. Now, that sounds awfully insignificant on some level, but what did she just do? She ingrained in her children in that moment that everyday wonderful occurrences are a blessing from God. She taught them in that brief little moment to be thankful for little things, to be in awe and <laughs> wonder of the creation that God has given us to live in. She took advantage of a teachable moment. Today, I was speaking with one of our elders, Ken Thronberry, and he was telling me about the other day, we, we, were, we, we had a meal at the church building and, uh, for, for a family that had, uh, it, was a, it was a funeral meal is what it was, and, 
and a couple of our young people, and I have to admit, well, my son was one of them, kind of jumped up into the front of the line faster than I wanted him to. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, that little turkey, I'm going to have to give him a talking to later on. We were laughing about it. Because what are you going to do after he's already got his plate and he's sitting there eating it? <laughs> but Ken said, you know, the other day I had to sit down. And he said, I had an opportunity to talk about something like that with, with John, my grandson. He said, the little Jimmy Dickens song, take a cold tater and, what is it, take a cold tater and wait. Some of you know that song? Some of you are looking at me like, no, never heard. I've never even heard of little Jimmy Dickens. Uh, well, I, okay. <laughs> May the bird of paradise fly up your nose, okay? That, that kind of deal. Jimmy Dickens sang a song in which he, he discussed a time, uh, an era in time when he was growing up when, when as a kid you had respect for a certain order of things. And Mama would tell him, hey, I know you're hungry, but we've got, we've got the visiting preacher or we've got a guest at our house, and so now you're just going to take your cold tater and go sit over there and wait your turn. And okay, well, that, 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 you know, it's, it's a tradition from, from our country, from, from our region of the world perhaps. But Ken took the time to explain. They had heard the song on the radio on an old country station. He took the time to explain what the context of that was. And he used that as a teachable moment to try to ingrain in his eight, nine-year-old grandson about having respect for those that are older than you. Took advantage of a teachable moment. Have you ever taken the time when you pass by an auto accident and you know that somebody's hurt? Have you ever actually said a prayer out loud with your kids driving down the road? God, please bless that situation. Please help them not be hurt too badly. What would that do if we took, opportun if we took those opportunities? What about, uh, uh, what about taking time to, to, to have Bible studies with other people and have your kids come along? Or get involved in something like uh, WEI, World English Institute, where you can, you're teaching English classes, but you're using the Bible for it, but you sit down and, and, and you, do, uh, you do it all online. I'm, uh, this is something that's been new... new, new <laughs> newly introduced to me uh, from the, over the course of this summer. And I, I'll just tell you right now, I, I'm hoping, God willing, my, my plan is to try to start sitting down with my nine-year-old. And we're going to start getting online and we're going to start teaching, hopefully teaching people on, in, in all corners of the world about God. And I'm gonna have, I hope to have him sit down. We take opportunities like that. We should be. When we're out on the way, when we're out and about living everyday lives, find ways to emphasize the glory and the rule of God in their lives. He says that we need to be uh, diligently teaching this to our children when we rise up. How do you begin your day? Or when you lie down? Let me start there. When you lie down, how do you finish out the night? Do you still pray with your kids before they go to bed? Do, do you take the time to make sure that you at least reflect on your day? It doesn't have to be four minutes before you go to bed. One of the greatest memories I have of growing up was sitting in the bed with my dad and singing hymns. We would sing two or three. And, and, and those hymns have been stuck in my mind and in my heart for the entirety of my 35 years of life. And it wasn't anything big. It was just simply taking the time to sing a few, two or three songs with me before I went to bed at night. How do you go to bed at night? What do you do before they go to sleep? How about when you rise up, what's the first thing you do in the morning? How do you begin your day? I told you I wanted to tell you a little bit more about this, this faith statement in, in Deuteronomy 4, 6, verses 4 and 5. This became a real staple and still is a huge staple within the Jewish community. They call it the Shema. Uh, Shema, it's just the first word of that Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. It, the, the Shema is a major part of that culture. Not, because, not just because it's a faith statement, but they make it a part of their everyday life. Whether it's when they get up and they have their morning periods of prayer, uh, or, or when you get into the traditional rabbinical schools, they will stand up and they will, they will recite the Shema as a group. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. That's how they start their day. You ever thought about taking time 
to just read a few verses from the Bible or find time to, to, uh, to quote some Bible verses with your kids and give them that, that biblical, spiritual encouragement before they head off to school. He says you need to put these as signs on your hands and your foreheads or on your doorposts. I, 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 you know, creative people, there's a lot of people out there a lot more creative than I am. And, uh, and, and that, that's just the long and the short of it. One of the things that comes to my mind is, do you have family rules that you put up on the wall on your house? We've got one that we bought from somewhere. It says family rules you're supposed to love, laugh, say I'm sorry. You ever thought about decorating your house a little bit? Now listen, I know some people can go over the top. I understand the idea that, that sometimes people wear their Christianity in their jewelry and on their shirts, and it's, and it's really just a facade. I get that. But do you think it might be of value if you sat down sometime and you either made or you were able to find see Bible verses on a placard? hung it up in your kids' room so that every morning when they wake up, the first thing they see when they crawl out of bed is the Word of God right there? What, what if you had the picture on the wall that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? I know of a brother down in Magnolia, Texas. He literally, over every doorway that goes in and out of his house, he has printed off in Hebrew the name of God. He has Yahweh over his doorposts. And it's not a show. I, I can tell you honestly, it's not a show. This is something he has chosen to do so that every time he leaves his house, the last thing he sees is the name of God. And that serves as a reminder to him as he goes out and about whose he is and who he represents. You want to raise strong kids. We need to be taking advantage of teachable moments. We need to be doing... Uh, Paul Faulkner, who used to do a lot of counseling and all that, he, he would talk about purposeful parenting. And we need to be making sure that we are keeping God's Word at the forefront of our children's minds in the way that we, in the way that we live our lives and the way we talk about it and doing things purposefully to make sure it happens. All right, I'd like for you to turn with me out of the book of Judges. Turn to, uh, to Judges chapter 3. Again, a little bit of context while you're turning. In Judges chapter 3, the people of Israel have come into the land of Canaan. Uh, they, they have taken it over. Uh, in fact, it tells us at the end of Joshua, of the book of Joshua, that they had the territory that God had promised to them. Not one of God's promises went unfulfilled. And they stayed faithful. And the book of Judges, you, you know it, it's a roller coaster ride. Right? They, go, they, they serve God for a while, and then they fall off. And then they serve Him for a while, and they fall off. In between, they are put under bondage to somebody. And then once they've been under bondage long enough, then they cry out for help because they realize the error of their ways, and God sends a deliverer. But there's an interesting passage, an interesting point here in, in the prologue, in the, in the, the introduction, introductory passages of, uh, of Judges. And I want you to read uh, with me, Judges chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. After he has made the statement that God has already made the statement to them, look, you've stopped following me, so I'm not going to drive the nations out any longer. I'm not going to be, the one, I'm not going to be fighting for you the way I was during the, the occupation campaign. But he says in chapter 3, verses 1 or 2, now these are the nations which the Lord left, so that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars of Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Second principle. We need to learn to make our kids do hard things. I've always found that statement in chapter 3, verse 2, very fascinating, that God left certain pagan nations in Canaan in order to teach the next generation how to fight war. Now that sounds not very godlike, does it? Until you consider this. To fight in war was just simply a way of life in that part of history. You don't have to like it, but you have to accept that that's part of what the culture and the world was. They fought war every year, constantly. 
And to fight in war was an essential life skill that had to be learned. It didn't come instinctively. Children didn't come out of the womb with a sword in their hand. And even with God's people, the Lord knew that there were certain lessons that the next generation had to learn, not just in theory, but they had to learn it with hands-on experience. They had to learn how to fight war by actually taking up the weapons, putting on the armor, and actually going out into battle. And so he left these nations behind. He didn't just drive them out. Because what if he had? What if he'd driven out all the opposition and all the enemies of Israel? What would have happened the first time the Philistines came in? They'd have lost it all because they wouldn't have known what to do. It's generally true that parents desire for their children to have a better life than what they had growing up, right? Do you want, do you want your kids to have things that you never did? Or at the very least, you want them to have, if you had a nice childhood growing up, you want them to at least have that much. And if you can provide more, you want to provide more. And you know, this in and of itself, I think it's a noble desire to want to give our kids more than what we had. However, I'm going to make an observation to you that in my opinion, the rise in affluence, the rise in wealth in our nation over the course of the generations has resulted in some unintended consequences. Namely, see if this is familiar to you. Namely, we have older generations who are frustrated and constantly bemoan a, what they perceive to be a lack of responsibility and discipline in the younger generations of today. You ever felt that way? You ever heard that complaint? Now here's the key question, church. Whose fault is that? Whose fault is it if... If we truly have a generation that has no concept of responsibility and discipline, whose fault is it? Are we going to lay it all at their feet? Or do we need to take a look in the mirror first? Church, listen, responsibility is not an instinct. It's a learned behavior, just like anything else that we do. Are we teaching our younger generations to live responsible lives with hands-on experience? Or do we do everything for them? And that's the key component, isn't it? Listen, I know. I, 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 I know kids because I got kids. I'll tell him to go do something. And the truth be told, after he sit there, after he sat there and he has just muddied his way through it and it's not done, sometimes it's just easier for me to pick it up and do it. Because I want to get it done. Let me tell you something. If, if I take that kind of approach with my boys and everything I ask them to do, if, if I get frustrated with them and I take over and I do it for them and I never let them learn how, they're never going to become efficient at getting it done. And they're never going to learn to take the accountability for it. We have to learn to let them do it on their own. Now, what kind of hard things are we supposed to be teaching our kids to do? Well, I think we can give it two, uh, two categories here. We can talk about life skills, and we can talk about emotional and spiritual skills. And life skills, I'm just, you can look through here, look at these. And we need to teach them to work, work with their hands. Learn how to cook. Learn how to clean. Learn how to take care of a home. Dads, teach your boys how to change the oil in their cars. I know they don't have to do it. Teach them anyway. Teach them how to change a flat tire. Teach them how to mow the grass properly. If you know how to build something, teach them how to build a few things. Teach them how to manage money. Teach them about personal hygiene. Teach them the value of working for a living. But also teach them that there are times when you can work and not have to expect payment in return. What about emotional skills or spiritual skills? We need to be teaching our kids that failure happens. You don't win every time. Now listen, I've played sports all of my life. And I've got boxes of trophies sitting in the attic in my mom and dad's house. We need to be teaching our kids that you don't always get a trophy just for showing up. We need to teach them that failure 
happens. And that failure is okay because failure is how we learn. Failure is how we grow. We need to teach them what sin is. What it really truly is and what it means to their relationship with God. We need to teach them how that, that, that God is the center of the universe, not them. And by the way, we need to make sure we learn as well that our kids are not the center of the universe. We need to learn that you can be happy without amassing huge piles of stuff. We need to learn, we need to teach our children how to live a life under the scope of God's design and His plan. Now I understand that this is not always easy to do. The article I mentioned to you earlier uh, about the hand strength stuff, th this is something that the author put in there. He said, now for parents of the privileged, raising a boy or a girl to be a young man or woman has to be an intentional act. You don't have, or you have to ignore the voices who are telling you to indulge your child's inclinations, no matter what they are, and, and train them to be not just morally courageous, but also physically strong. Look, you know, parents, we live in an age where certain things, like changing the oil, you don't have to do that anymore. You take it down to, to, autos, to, to uh, Jiffy Lube. We have to manufacture some of those lessons. I get it. But we need to be doing it. And this is a biblical concept as well. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12 that we are to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands, as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Paul will also remind us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction or the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If we want the next generation of Christians to be strong men and women of God, we're going to have to make sure that we teach them to do hard things in those formative years so that they will learn to become efficient at them, so that they will learn to take responsibility as a grown human being and be able to take responsibility for their lives before God. I had one more, but I run out of time with it. Maybe here in a minute I'll give you the five-minute overview when everybody comes back in. But thank you for your time and your attention this evening.